Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to yet another Ironside Take 30. Uh, so today's session will focus on Cognos Analytics, specifically modern data and approaches where we're going to give you uh, a walkthrough of dynamic cubes uh, versus data modules and data sets. Uh, certainly, dynamic cubes has been uh, a feature available in Cognos for a while now, but we wanted to compare and contrast with something that is more recent and that, that being data modules and data sets. Um, so for an agenda, we'll go through introductions. Uh, we'll do an overview of dynamic cubes and data sets and then open it up for question and answer. All right, and in terms of today's presenters, we have Susan Ma, who's a technical manager uh, on the Ironside team, been with us for, I think at this point, 12 years, maybe more. Uh, and Michael Vollmer, who's a senior BI consultant as well. Um, and uh, Michael is, uh, you know, we're gonna we're gonna go through here. I think Michael's gonna talk to most of the content, and Susan and I will add color uh, as we go. So, in terms of upcoming sessions, um, we have, uh, you know, this is the last session we're having in June. Look for an announcement around our July sessions coming out soon. Uh, we do have one more uh, session for the not if, but when data protection take 30 series, um, which is June 29th and focusing on privacy and compliance. All right, with that, I will turn it over to Michael. All right, guys, um, thanks for joining us. Uh, so today we're gonna talk again about, we're gonna compare and contrast really the two main um, leading tools for in-memory caching, if you will, in Cognos. Um, dynamic cubes and data sets. So we're going to start off with dynamic cubes. So dynamic cubes has been around for quite some time, as Scott has mentioned, right? Um, it's been around, I know, at least 10 plus years now. And, um, you know, I'm going to go into it too heavily, but what I do want to talk about is kind of the different architectures between the two different solutions. So dynamic cube is, an, again, is an in-memory OLAP solution. It is a true cube. Um, one of the things to know about this is that it is attached to the actual java process in cognos and that's important because that's where it resides so in situations for example with dynamic cubes if you have multi servers each server has its own dynamic cube attached to it and requires the cube itself to be started and loaded on each on each multi server environment right and that's going to be important when we talk about data sets because that's going to be a little different right so one of the biggest issues or we'll say issues but the biggest concerns is that again multi server environments you have to set up certain rules to be able to uh, to handle, the, you know, multi-service and caching. But because it's all in memory, it's extremely fast, right? So you're really only limited by the volume of RAM that you have on your PC, right? Now, the caveats, right, is if let's say that Java process crashes, which is your query process. If it does crash because some user creates a crazy report or whatever it may may be, then your cube is gonna gonna shut down. Right, and unfortunately, there's nothing saved anywhere. So when that process restarts, that cube's got to reload again from your source system, right, back into RAM. And so unfortunately, if it's a if it takes a while to load, it's going to take a you know it's going to take that same amount of time to reload that query process. So that's the one big um, caveat is that it does live with the Java process. And again, no data is stored in Cognos; it's only in memory at that point in time. Okay. Now, some of the things about dynamic cubes is important to understand is that your data sources, you're limited by, it le leverages dynamic query mode, right? And if you're not familiar with that, basically what dynamic query mode, one of the caveats is that it has to have a, a Java um, driver, right? So for example, some of you are limited by the databases being the main database players, Oracle, SQL Server, IBM, et cetera, right? So obviously, no local Excel files or access database or anything like that. It has to actually be a, uh, a relational database that supports, you know, JDBC drivers. Okay. Um, it also does require, because it is a cube, it's going to require you to have a, a nice structure in place, a star scheme or a snowflake. It, you, if you don't have a really great um, data warehouse structure in place, then you're going to have, it's going to be very difficult to build a dynamic cube. You're going to run into lots of issues. I'm not saying that you can't do that, but it ends up requiring you to create a lot more work on the back end, th either through database views or some other ETL process to, to mimic a, a star snowflake, right? Um, one of the key things here is it does not leverage existing Cognos metadata. 
So if you have a framework model, it does not use that. Now, it does actually allow you to pull in a DMR if you have built a DMR in framework, which I don't think most people have used in quite some time. But if you have one, you can actually replicate that as a dynamic cube. But again, it, it, it more likely pulls it, it pulls the data in and then lose, then it never connects back to that framework model. Okay. So that's the only thing you can pull in. So most people don't have DMR. So really you're not able to leverage your existing metadata. And so you have to recreate all of that joins and those metadata in dynamic cubes itself. Um, the, one of the, one of the benefits of dynamic cubes is that it does contain in memory data. Obviously you can load all the data into memory for fast response times, but you can also have a hybrid cube where you have, let's say the higher level data in memory and then the more detailed, more granular data can actually be a live connection back to the database, right? So a lot of people don't know this, but you don't have to load the whole thing into memory. You can have a hybrid, right? So that's one of the, one of the benefits of it is the flexibility to be able to do that, right? Um, because uh, it is a cube, you're, you do have dimensions, and dimensions require a unique hierarchy. So you can only have a drill down path, you know, that makes sense. You know, you can't mix and match dimensions together, right? So if you have products, you have to start from the top product line to product type all the way down to the actual individual product, right? It has to have a unique hierarchy path, right? Um, dynamic cubes, one of the other caveats is that to build that, it requires you to have an installed the cube designer, which is a client tool, a desktop tool, and the aggregate advisor also, right? So you do have to have IT's involvement. These tools have to be involved, installed and configured for you to be able to uh, leverage dynamic cubes, right? Now, one of the other benefits of dynamic cubes is that you can actually link cubes together, what they call virtual cubes. So you can actually have um, cells in one cube, maybe inventory or maybe forecast in a different cube or different subsets of data in different cubes link them all together into one what they call virtual cube so it seems seamless to your users and that's actually very powerful right because then you can refresh certain cubes at different times and have different data structures right in different cubes but again combine them together into a single cube for reporting right so again um, and it's a virtual cube so from a reporting standpoint um Again, if you've not, if you're, if you're used to cubes, right, dynamic cubes, this looks just, you know, this looks familiar, it should look familiar, right? So you work with dimensions, they're not tables and they're not columns, right? They are true dimensions. And as such, when you look at them in a, in a screenshot here, you can actually see the values in those columns, right? So for example, we have a products dimension, right? And then I know that there's golf and golf equipment is made up of irons and then whatever the different products are, right? So I can actually see those individual values in the dimension explorer, not in the report. Like I don't, I'm not actually querying the data yet, right? This is something I can, I can actually see that in the, in the, in the, the uh, hierarchy of the tree, right? Now, one of the caveats too, again, it is a cube. So you must use OLAP functions that are in, well, technically called MDX. So they're not SQL functions. So if you're not familiar with that, there is a learning curve around how to use some of these unique functions, right? All right, and again, you know, this is, it visually kind of looks similar to tables, but it's a lot different, right? Mainly, again, there's a hierarchical approach to everything. And so again, just a screenshot of what it looks like in reporting tool, so Cognos reporting. You know, you look, again, you see your dimensions, you see the little icons are different, right? You see your levels and your dimensions and things like that, right? Generally speaking, you're gonna build cross tab type of reports or charts, right? Again, it's not meant to be flat, it's meant to be multi-dimensional. So that's one of the you know unique things about dynamic cubes is that it is a true OLAP solution. All right, now what I want to spend some time on is is actually um, is data sets. So data sets I think are one of the most powerful tools that Cognos has. A lot of people don't know about, right? And so if I have a little text flies, there it is. <laughs> so one of the things I want to point out here is that. If you, if you started with Cognos 11 way back when it first came out, data sets have been around for since the beginning or right around that time, but they have come a long way since then. So, you know, initially in space, a lot of people had, you know, saw data sets and they probably saw that there was a massive limitations. You know, they were really kind of limited to just uploading files and things like that. And there was size limitations and all kinds of issues, right? That is not the case now. Data sets are extremely powerful, right? So one of the key things about data sets versus the other tools, especially dynamic cubes, is a data set 
again, it's going to be loaded into memory, or, or technically it's cached. We'll talk about, it's not really in memory, but we'll talk about that in a second. But it is cached in Cognos. But one of the key things to start off with is it's all web-based. So you don't need client tools installed. You don't need to work with IT to have them install and configure different tools on your on your computer. Everything, again, is is going to be based inside a Cognos website, just like you would with, let's say, writing a report, right? Now, you do have to have permissions. Obviously, like just like you need permissions right now to write a report. But again, it's the same interface. It's drag and drop. And again, as you can see from the screenshot, you're actually inside of the uh, web interface, right? Okay. And again, it comes out of the box of Cognos 11, no additional installs, right? So a couple of things about data sets from a performance standpoint is your, your extremely fast response time, right? And if I have time, I'll show you a demo here in a little bit. But the key thing here is it can actually hold up to, we're saying around 8 million rows. There's no necessarily cutoff. It just happens to be there's a certain number that you hit that, to be honest, like, you know, you're not trying to replicate your whole data warehouse. Obviously, it's a data set. Right, but do understand that it depends on the, how much data, how many columns you have, right? How much you can load. But I was able to load up to eight million rows um, against a against a Snowflake table this week, and it actually performed really well. Loaded within a few minutes, a few sorry, a few seconds actually. So, and the response time was instantaneous, depending on what you're trying to do. One of the key things here to understand about data sets is unlike dynamic cubes, it's not actually stored in memory. It actually is stored in the content store. So what happens is, is that when you build your data set from whatever it may be, it's going to load that data and it's going to store it as a parquet file in the content store. Okay. Now that's key because if you restart Cognos or process crashes or you have multi-servers or whatever, you don't have any issues with it because it's not stored in memory. It's actually stored in the content store itself. Right. So if Cognos has to be restarted, no worries. You don't have to reload all that data because it's already stored as a, as a cached file, if you will, inside of, inside the context store, right? Now, again, the data does get cached into memory on access. So when you do access the data set, there's usually initial, a couple seconds of performance, if you will, just to accessing that. But it actually does load it into memory and then eventually it does kind of let that go, right? But uh, just, like a, just like running reports against, you know, you're building a report now in Report Studio or whatever it's called is, um, it's very similar, right? It's like, you you know, obviously your subsequent run times are going to be quicker just because of some caching, right? So so there is caching in memory, but again, it really is physically stored as a file or a parquet file format, Apache parquet in the content store itself. You don't have to do any extra work for multi-server environments. So if you have, you know, no matter how many number of servers you have, it automatically, um, just like, just like, again, just like a normal package, it automatically uh, includes multi-server environments. There's no additional configurations, right? And again, performance is actually good, if not better in most cases than dynamic cubes, as long as you're under a right around 8 million, right? So it just depends, again, the performance is kind of, depends on what you're trying to do with it, right? But if you're doing, if you're trying to build a more relational type of reports or tabular, if you will, um, then dyna or sorry, data sets is the way to go. All right, so the other thing that's uh, important to understand is that unlike, unlike the dynamic cubes, is data sets actually allow you to use any data source, right? So you can actually pull in data from a database like normal. You can actually upload files. You can pull it from existing uh, cubes or framework manager packages, and you can actually leverage data from other data modules or data sets, right? So you can actually have a data set that you build a data set off of, right? So... Um, that's one of the most powerful things about data sets is that you can actually take and pull that data from any source. And because it's loaded into a parquet file, it's irrelevant where it came from. At that point, it's all the same, right? So I can have a, a model, which in this case will be a data model, a data module, excuse me, that hits multiple data sets and they can, all those data sets can come from any existing source data, right? So I can combine any structure that I need. I'm not required to have a snowflake or any kind of star schema, right? So you can model your data just like you do with framework, you know, into a data module, for example, or into a framework model, and you can pull that data and cache it into a data set. All right. So, all right. Uh, oops, let's go back to that. I think I was supposed to show. Uh... All right, there we go. Well, so if, again, looking at the, um, looking at the screenshot here real quickly, um, so just how you create a data set. So you, again, this is a data module 
That's it's according to the icon against Snowflake data. You can do this again against a framework pack, package. You can do it actually against anything. You can have a file that's uploaded and simply click on the three dots and you can create the option to create a data set. So again, a data set itself is cache data, okay? You cannot report against the data set directly. We wanna make sure this is clear. What a data set is, is cache data. So it's like a, like a cube if you wanna think of it in that concept. It's cache data in your content store. You still have to model that data in your, um, in your tool, in this case, data modules, right? So you still have to model that like any other table or any other data source, right? And so again, <clears throat> if you look at the interface for uh, the data set, again, it's all web-based and it's just simple drag and drop, very similar to Framework Manager in a way, right? And so, like I was saying earlier, is that you do model this and you do model your data sets in a data module. You can combine uh, multiple data sets together. Each data set can come from a totally different source. It does not matter. It doesn't, you know, there's no requirement that says that's to come from the same database or the same structure or anything. So again, a data module, if you're not familiar with data modules, data modules is basically framework manager on the web. You know, so you model your data. There's no data stored in a data module. It is a just a metadata uh, tool itself, right? So here's a case, an example where I had multiple data sets, um, each loaded and then I joined them all together to create somewhat of a star schema in a data module, right? So I can actually refresh my customers and my facts and things like that at separate times because they are data sets, right? So again, just making sure that you, that's clear, a data set is cache data. So you do have to refresh that. It's not real time data, right? It is cache data. But because of that, you can manage them individually. And again, you can create a nice join star schema just like you could in Framework Manager, right? So here's my example um, of a data set that I loaded this week. Actually, it was actually 6 million. So I loaded 6 million rows of data and the time it took to refresh that set was less than 18. Um, it took about 18 minutes, excuse me, to uh, pull that data down and load it into, uh, into memory, right? So, you know, pretty fast, right? And it just depends on how much data. And this actually was done on my local computer, my local desktop. And using my, you know, basically Snowflake is a web-based database. So I was using my own internet connection, things like that. So none of this was local from a database standpoint. So again, you can load quite a bit of data into a data set and it does actually compact it pretty well. You can see the size is only 148 megs. Now, I'll, if I can have time, I'll do a demo of the response time. But again, it is quite quick when it comes to report authoring, right? So again, from a report authoring standpoint, it looks like a table, right? So this is again, Cognos reporting tool. If you'll notice that my 6 million I, you know, data set that I have out here, again, I use data modules to uh, model the data, but it looks just like a table, right? So from an end user standpoint, they're not gonna see dimensions, right? They're not gonna see members and the structure of a normal cube. They're gonna see what looks like a normal framework manager model with, uh, you, know, you know, columns and tables structure, right? So for a lot of users that are used to that, that experience, data, data sets and data modules are the way to go, data sets are, because again, it, it gives them representation that looks like a table but it's cached, All right? So the other thing too is um, one of the, the one of the key features here is that you know from a cube standpoint you do have dimensions and there's that natural natural hierarchy in a dimension where you can drill down from a higher level of detail to a lower granular level. So there are no dimensions in data sets slash data modules, but there is a concept called navigation paths. And one of the the great things about navigation paths is that it doesn't have to be um, unique. So for example, I have a navigation path here that goes, it's, all, it's the calendar path and it goes fiscal year, month, day, right? And simply enough, you drill down like you normally would on you know a day, a year to a month to whatever. But I can also create an, any other combination that I want. So in this case, I start off with the year and I can drill down a product line and then I can drill down to customer. These are all coming from different tables, Again, they are not obviously unique. You know, there's not, it's not a unique hierarchy. So a navigation path is just that. It's a navigation path. It's not a hierarchy. It's not a drill down necessarily as much as it's a, a different way to look at data, right? So for example, I'm looking at fiscal year 2010, right? And so when I click on it, what I should happen oh, is when I drill down, now I'm looking at product line. Now again, it's just a sample data, but 
I was able to go from a year down to the product line, right? So again, a little different than a cube, where a cube does require you to stay usually within the same table structure, and it has to be the same type of data. You can mix and match different um, <clears throat> different columns and, and data sets, if you will, data data points in, in a navigation path, right? And you can have as many navigation paths as you want. So again, it's really up to you to define that. There's no limitations. All right, so then a couple of things you need to know that we've talked about already. Uh, data is cached as a parquet file. So if you're not familiar with Apache parquet, you know, basically it it's a columnar storage format. Um, it's extremely fast. You're seeing a lot of that used now with uh, Databricks and some of the more, um, you know, some more of the data lake structures these days, right? So big data is, is a lot of that's using that Apache Parquet format and it's quick, it's extremely fast. So Cognos is leveraging that as part of the data sets themselves, right? So when it loads the data from whatever source into the Cognos content store, it's actually transforming it into a Parquet file, right? And again, it's stored in the content store. So if you stop and start Cognos, it doesn't have to reload the data from the source system. It's actually stored in the content store, right? Again, the uh, performance against the files are extremely fast, even at 6 million plus rows. So I created a query yesterday, um, returned, I don't know, a couple, let's say a few thousand rows of data from my, my large data set file and it returned within, you know, less than 10 seconds. So again, it, it, it runs quick, it does great. So it's not meant to replace your data warehouse, obviously. So, you know, 6 million, I think is a six to 8 million is probably a good number. I haven't seen anything more than that. You probably just want to go against your relational database. But um, just again, just to point out the volume is, um, you know, it, it can handle quite a bit of volume, right? So think of data sets and really data modules. Because again, you, you build a data set, but you gotta, you've got to model that in a data module. And a data module, again, it's like framework manager sort of on the web. So think of it a framework model, you know, think of framework manager data, but cached, right? So pre-generated data that's cached into memory, right? So take your take a framework model, put it in memory, and give it to a user. That's basically the concept of data sets and data modules. So again, you can't consume directly in a report, right? So um, you can, and apparently in dashboards and exploration, but as far as like a normal report, again, you can't connect to a data set directly. You have to and pull that into a data module, model it first. You, and again, you can pull in as many data sets as you want. So a data set would be, could be a representation of one table. It could be multiple tables combined together, whatever. But again, think of a, a data set as a cache data. And again, you can pull mul multiple data sets into your um, into your data module and join those things together like you would any relational tables. <clears throat> again, you can mash up mixed data. You know, I think that's one of the key things here. You can have data coming from Excel files that you join, that you cache in as a data set, and then turn around and join that against data from, let's say, a relational database, right? So that's, uh, it, and again, to the user standpoint, they don't know the difference, right? It just looks like a table to them. Uh, you don't have to worry about having ETL get involved to ingest the data into your data warehouse. So if you have actuals in your data warehouse, but you have forecast data, let's say in a flat file, maybe CSV or an Excel file, you can combine all that together pretty quickly. And again, it's all web-based interface. So there's really not a whole lot of overhead to, you know, to create these, these models and these data sets. So again, just like anything else, the data is stored, it's not real time. So you have to get, you have to refresh the data sets. You can schedule a refresh on an hourly, daily, weekly basis, just like you can anything else, right? So, so again, if you start creating, um, just understand that, do understand that again, if you create a lot of data sets and create a lot of large data sets, then it does take up space in your content store. So you do wanna think about, you know, using external object stores, you know, for that. So if you're not familiar with that, that is a way to, it's an add-on feature for Cognos to be able to store some of the larger, not only report format, report outputs, but also obviously data sets into another file-based system, right? So again, it, you know, it will make your data, your content store quite large, but again, it does reside, a content store resides in your database, so you have all the access to your RDS to uh, manage that. All right, so again, considerations. Um, uh, Eight million rows is pretty much your cutoff. Your navigation paths, um, are not quite as intuitive as, as a dimension, right? So there's a little bit, it's a little bit different interface. You can't just drill down on, you have to, you have to click on something extra to, to drill down. But, um, you know, it's not, again, it's not, it's not the true drill down, drill up. It is a totally different concept. And again, that's a navigation path. Right? 
Uh, data sets can only be used modeled using data modules. Um, you can't use framework manager, so you do have to learn data how to use a data module. Again, it's pretty straightforward. It's really it's just take a framework as a web-based tool. I mean, it's fairly intuitive. Um, the only downside is that there are some limitations with data modules that, you know, compared to framework manager. So things like um, you can't use a store procedure, for example, some of the advanced macros and parameter maps, things like that are not going to be available to you in a data module. So, but for the most part, the rest of it is available to you, so that's key, right? Uh, do understand data sets are not cubes. So if you're expecting to use OLAP functions, you know, if you want to use tuples and children and all the other things you're, you know, you're used to from an OLAP standpoint, that is not the case. It is more SQL driven, so the functions are going to be SQL type functions, right? Um, it's also not as mature as dynamic cubes and transformer cubes. Um, so dynamic cubes again has been around for many, many years, but um, data sets have actually been around about five years now right so a little bit give give or take about five years so they're you know they're not brand new but they're again as far as just history you know uh, they're not as old as dynamic cubes and then lastly security and governance is a little different um and we'll talk about this later but the uh the big the key thing here is as to how you handle security is is not as robust as say a dynamic cube where you can actually specify what dimensions or what values people can see you don't have that same flexibility with data sets slash data modules. All right, so just to contrast and contrast a little bit here, um, just so you guys understand the difference between a package and a data module, because again, data modules, you know, we're saying data sets, but a data set is just a, is the data itself. You still have to include data modules in the conversation because the data has to be modeled in something, right? In this case, it's gonna be a data module, right? So again, you can't use a data set in a framework model so one of the key things just to kind of contrast and compare packages are going to be geared like framework manager packages are going to be geared towards it users right so technical guys that have access that have installed the client tool right it's a desktop tool it's been around there's tons of information out there. there's lots of documentation right uh, right now it's being maintained by ibm but it's definitely not being enhanced so meaning that ibm is has ibm would prefer that everybody move away from packages and they want everybody to move towards data module. Data modules is the, the future, if you will, of your metadata models, okay? And it's really actually oriented more towards a line of business users, right? Without, you know, again, IT still involved, but again, you don't have to have client tools installed. You don't have to worry about how, you know, what the name of the dispatcher is and all the configurations because it is web-based tool, just like, again, just like writing reports in Cognos, right? It's just, it's just another web-based interface. All you need is permissions, right? Um, it's much more modern user experience. So if you were to look at those two tools side by side, framework manager versus a data module, you'll see that obviously data modules is a, a more smoother looking interface. You know, it looks more like modern, you know, modern website, right? Uh, it is, again, it's the go-to tool. It's, it's actively being enhanced right now. So you're going to see more and more enhancements as, you know, every, every new version comes out, there's always something that they add to this, right? To data modules uh ai automation is recognized that data modeling is a necessary evil okay <laughs> i'm not sure where that came from i think that may have been thrown in there by scott but the point is you're going to have to model that so it actually does have a um, one of the one of the nice pieces of data modules is actually it can read your data and kind of make a guess for you as to how to model that data right so it looks at column names it looks at indexes uh, it looks at any defined uh, dependencies in, from your database and it actually built out a data module for you using um, certain AI features, right? You know, there's some pros and cons. Sometimes it works really well, sometimes it doesn't. But again, it does have a, you know, that, that's being enhanced more and more every day so that people can rapidly crank out, you know, data modules against their relational data warehouse or data sets. All right, so we're getting towards the end here real quick. So um, the last thing we'll do is uh, consideration. So just contrast and compare, again, a summary. So dynamic cubes from a data volume standpoint, you're only limited by the RAM on your server because then it lives in the RAM. Right, so it loads it, it loads it into memory. So if you need more space or you need more whatever you need a lot, you know, you have a large cube, you just need to more add more RAM to your server, right? Whereas data sets more or less do have a hard and fast cutoff and it's right around eight million rows. That really just, just kind of depends on how many columns you have. So if you have you know 50 column table, you might not get the eight million, right? So it just really depends on a, it's more of a sizing issue, right? And it's not so much that it can't load it. It's just that there's just a, a degradation that's so large that it becomes unusable after a certain point in time, right? 
Um, so data sources, again, both do require uh, that, you know, from a data set standpoint, excuse me, so from a data dynamic cubes, you do, it is, it is use JDBC connections, so dynamic query mode. Um, so bigger databases, Oracle, SQL Server, things like that. Um, it does require Snowflake star schemas, so, and you can only use one single data source, right? So you can't combine, again, a CSV file together with a database table, things like that. Whereas with data sets, you can, <laughs> like I said, anything. So, you know, as long as you can pull it into Cognos, and again, it can be an access database, it can be an ODBC connection, it can be a flat file, it can be a database connection, it can be another data set, um, it can come from a cube, et cetera. They can actually combine all those together. You can pull that into a data set because it transforms it to a parquet file, and you can join those together um, just like you could any other table, right? Uh, again, performance just depends on the memory and your caching alignment. So dynamic cubes, one of the key thing here is that you do have to cache that. You do have to tell it how to cache things correctly. And so as long as you do that the correct way, you know, you're, you can actually get great performance. But there is sort of an art to that. So, you, again, you do have to cache it correctly. Um, from a data set, you really don't have to worry about that as much. It's more likely the volume and making sure that you stay within a reasonable number, right? Uh, maintenance, they both have to be updated and refreshed. So, again, no, no, nothing special here. They both have to, you know, data has to be refreshed um, on some kind of schedule, right? You can put role level security in dynamic cubes, but for data sets, really data modules, there are no, there's no role level security in a data module right now for data sets. So a data module against an actual real table, a database table, you can provide role level security, but if that source in your data module is a data set, then there is no functionality to create a uh, security filter around that. So, all right, so again, Dynamic cubes, our cubes, they use MDX. Data sets are not, so no MDX. Um, you know, multi-server environments or takes extra setup for dynamic cubes where there's absolutely no considerations for data sets. It is dispatcher agnostic, so you don't have to do any extra work. You build your data set, it's there. There's nothing else additional you have to do, right? Out of the box, you got your dimensions. They do uh, drill up, drill down for dynamic cubes. Just natural data sets. You do have to create navigation paths for a little bit different, right? And then from a licensing standpoint, again, you just, you need Cognos Explorer to create a dynamic cube and to consume data, whereas the data sets, it does require a Cognos user, right? So again, we can talk about that a little bit offline, but there is a, you know, more, more, the key here is that there isn't a really additional required. Most likely, if you have access to create reports, then you can create a data set, right? All right, Scott, um, do we have any uh, questions here? I know we're kind of rushing through the end here, but yeah, um, I mean, in, fa in fact, we are uh, we're we're a, a bit over, so um, I think we will curtail the questions uh, for today. Um, so, so certainly, um, certainly, I'll look forward to an announcement about our July sessions. Um, and certainly, if you have uh, if if you have topics you'd like us to focus on, like us to cover, certainly send uh, send an email to the email address shown there on the screen. Uh, here to help at ironsidegroup.com, and uh, we will uh, we'll make that part of an upcoming session. So thank you very much uh, for joining us today, and uh, looking forward to talking to you again. Thanks. We're going to post this on the website too. Correct. Yes, indeed. Okay. All right. Thanks, guys. All right. Thank you.